to have a review today um, for for the uh, string filter in Jonacob, and he will speak on subalgebra, subregion duality, and the emergence of space-time time in holography. Thanks, Hong, uh, for agreeing to speak, and uh, please start. Okay, yeah, yeah. Thanks for the uh, invitation to speak here. So, um, yeah. So the main uh, uh, um, result I am going to talk about has been uh, obtained by Sam uh, uh, Lloyd Hauser. Um, he is now a, a postdoc at Princeton. So here are some papers we have written so far. Um, so yeah. One of the, of course, the uh, the prime questions in quantum gravity is the how does space and time say emerges in the semi-classical limit uh, in the quantum gravitational theory? Um, yeah, because in general, if you uh, in the full quantum regime, we expect space and time fluctuates, geometry fluctuates, so uh, it's not clear there's a well-defined notion uh, of geometry. And this is not well defined notion of geometric concept as space or time. And uh, so, yeah, so uh, uh, this question can be uh, formulated more precisely in the context of holography, say in the ADS CFT duality. Uh, we, uh, because there, here we have a dual, dual field theory. And then we can ask how does space, box, space, and time, and in particular, uh, various geometric notions like space-time regions, etc., causality, they arise, say, in the uh, in the field theory side. So, for example, let's just consider, say, you, you have a box space-time. Say this is so. So I draw the cylinder. Uh, uh, this cylinder you should view it as a box of ADS, and these two lines are the boundary, cylindrical boundary. And let's just imagine you have some kind of space-time region, say, in ADS, okay? Uh, some causally complete region uh, in ADS. So the natural question is, how do we describe such a region in the boundary theory? Okay, so, um, so how do you, yeah. Uh, uh, for example, how do you describe some kind of interior time, which describes the, say, the physics inside the region? And how do you describe the causal structure associated with this region? So this, region associated with some light cone structure, and also how you actually take you, what is the global time which can take you outside the region? Okay, so these are the most elementary questions we can ask uh, 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 about the Bach description. And uh, uh, these are very difficult questions. Okay, so far we don't actually, uh, 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 prior, we don't actually have a formalism to describe such, a, 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 um, yeah, to describe, uh, to understand these questions. A very closely related question, say, is the, uh, how to describe, how to understand the emergence of the region behind the horizon, say, uh, in the black hole geometry. So this is one of the simplest black hole geometry, which is the uh, internal black hole in ADS, which is dual to two copies, say, of the CFT in the thermal field double state. So here, there's a lateral description of the, uh, uh, there's a time like killing vector outside the horizon. Uh, and this time, say, it can be naturally uh, uh, identified with the boundary time. So there's a very natural way to describe the physics uh, in this R and L region, which are outside the horizon. But, but there are many mysteries related to, to this future and the past regions. Okay, so uh, how do we describe them? Using the field theory sites because of the time, the boundary time stops at the horizon. Okay. And it's not clear what is the time inside the, uh, uh, how do we describe the time uh, uh, inside the horizon? And in particular, say, for example, say, how do you describe the cross collect time? So a cross collect time can, can take you, say, in the conformity, conformity the whole space time, take you inside the future and past region. And also, how do we understand from the boundary theory, uh, the horizons and associated causal structure, say associated with the horizon. And also say, even though the left and the right uh, 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 system, they don't seem to interact with each other, but you can actually send them 
send object to fall through the horizon, and then they can then they can interact behind the horizon. Okay, how do we describe this kind of interactions? So, so all these questions are, yeah, just, uh, so this is a special case of these more general questions I mentioned earlier. So how do we describe using the boundary theory, the emergence of this uh, different kind of Bach regions? Okay. So the goal of the talk is to develop a formalism say, for addressing these kind of questions. Okay. Uh, sometimes even with the formalism, uh, uh, um, the the yeah uh, under, uh, still understanding some of those questions can be technically hard, but at least uh, we give a conceptual framework for uh, for addressing these questions. So and the key would be the entanglement structure uh, of the bark and the boundary systems. Okay, and uh, but actually one of the key elements from here is that this entanglement structure actually cannot be captured. But the usual notion of when we talk about entanglement, say entanglement entropies or et cetera. Okay. And, uh, and they, uh, uh, but they can capture it by, by the operator algebraic structure. Okay. And uh, so I think this also maybe uh, could be one of the main lessons for, for string field theory, because the, uh, in string field theory, I think this operator algebraic structure should be very natural. Okay. And, uh, um, Okay, so so let me just say the uh, uh, the uh, give a slogan for the um, for the final result. So what we want to advocate is that the box space time locality. Yeah, so if you want to talk about local regions in the box, then you have to uh, uh, have a sense of locality. Okay, so the box space time locality is actually a geometrization, say of emergent boundary types three by one two minus alpha algebras. Okay, so I will explain those, uh, uh, um, yeah, those words uh, 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 later. Um, yeah, those, so the key is to somehow understanding various emergent sub-algebras in the boundary theory and actually holds the key to understand the emergence of the box space time. So, so more explicitly, we can show, yeah, we want to argue that, uh, 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 a emergent type three one monuma algebra, a sub algebra in the boundary theory has a one to one correspondence with spark space time regions. Okay. And also the properties of such uh, a type three one monuma algebras and actually leads to geometric notions such as horizons, different times, causal structure, et cetera. Okay. And so, uh, so that's why we call the sub algebra sub region duality. So uh, the subalgebra uh, on the boundary theory can be used to describe geometric uh, uh, subregions in the box, and this generalizes the, the the standard story of the subregion subregion duality. We sometimes call it entanglement wedge construction. Yeah, the construction. So so this significantly generalizes uh, uh, this story. Yeah yeah. So this story subregion subregion started. Uh, uh, duality started started with the, uh, uh, those early papers. There, there are many many papers here. I'm just uh, 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 I include two two very early papers. Okay, so so let me just remind you quickly what is this sub region sub region duality. So imagine so now let's consider a single time slice, say of ADS, which is represented by a circle. So the circle is the boundary. And the uh, the region inside the circle is ADS, so this is a single time slice. And now, if you consider the sub region in the boundary theory, so let's call it R, and then you can draw the RT surface associated with this boundary region, which is this gamma R. Then the region between this RT surface and the boundary region R is the region we call ER. And uh, and so the uh, the statement of the uh, sub region sub region duality is that the physics in this ER should be uh, equivalent, yeah, or can be described by the physics. The, the, the Bach physics in ER can be described by the boundary physics in, in R and the vice versa. Okay. So, um, yeah, so this is a, a, a very powerful uh, relation and have played a very important role in many uh, discussions of holography, including the, uh, the recent 
a page curve story, etc. And uh, but but the subregion duality only applies to the Bach region, which are uh, yeah which ends at the boundary, and also uh, only applies to very special Bach regions which correspond to this entanglement wedge, correspond to a boundary ridge. Okay. But but once but we can actually generalize this story. Essentially, you replace this boundary region by the operator algebra in that boundary region, which I call XR. Okay, so if you replace this boundary region R by the operator algebra in that region, which, which uh, mathematically and physically they're equivalent. Okay, uh, um, uh, instead of talking about this geometric region, you can just uh, uh, characterize everything uh, in this region, say in terms of the operator algebra in that region. But now this operator algebra uh, 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 language become much more general because you can define operator algebra uh, 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 not associated with a geometric region. Okay, so you can describe, uh, define much general uh, uh, operator algebras. And this leads to this sub algebra, sub region duality. Uh, and that's precisely the freedom we get to describe this kind of, say, interior region in the box, which don't say, uh, ha, uh, uh, have low, uh, 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 yeah, does not end on the boundary. Turns out to describe this kind of bark region, you need a more general, say, sub algebras, which have no, <clears throat> which have no boundary, uh, 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 um, yeah, geometric interpretation, but you can define them algebraically. Yeah, so here is the uh, plan for the, uh, for the talk. So, so he first I will talk about some key elements used. So first is the entanglement. Uh, I give a very quick introduction about entanglement and the monomial algebras. And also I will uh, talk about uh, Najee and Nimit of the ADS duality uh, to highlight uh, various key aspects of it. And then I will uh, talk about the formulation of this duality for general Bach region. And then use this, uh, um, the bulk emergence of the cross connect time and the uh, even the horizon of internal black hole as a uh, uh, as an example, and then yeah, then I can talk about more general examples. I can talk about a new insights into sub region, sub region duality, etc. Uh, um, yeah, and then I can conclude. But 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 this uh, plan is all way over ambitious, I would say. Uh, 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 I, yeah, in the in the one and a half hour talk, I have never uh, actually uh, uh, covered all of them. Uh, uh, most often, I just cover the first two points, and uh, yeah. So today we can just do whatever. Uh, we, uh, yeah, just yeah, we can just uh, 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 cover whatever we can. Uh, uh, actually, I suspect for people who are interested in say say spin field theory, who are interested in understanding say how to use string field theory, say, to capture entanglement in string theory, or, or to capture this kind of uh, uh, um, yeah, similar questions of emergence of space and time and the background independence, et cetera. For this kind of questions in string field theory, uh, I think the uh, uh, one and the two uh, uh, would be of most interest. And because they already illustrate uh, 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 the, yeah, this, this all, uh, operate algebraic perspective to thinking about this question. Yeah, the power of that perspective. And the rest, I think it's more related to, say, if you are interested in holography and then, uh, and then that will be more relevant. Yeah. Anyway, so, so, so please feel free to ask any questions uh, uh, you have. Yeah. So do you have any questions so far? Okay, good. Um, yeah, so let's say a few words about the entanglement, say, of a quantum system. So let's imagine we have a quantum system, and which are represented by a box here. Now imagine you can divide this quantum system into two subsystems, which are labeled by one and two. Okay. And normally we assume there's a, a factorization of the Hilbert space. It's just the full Hilbert space of the system, so it can be factorized into the Hilbert space for the subsystem one and the Hilbert space for subsystem two. So the full Hilbert space is a tensor product. So in such a situation, and then let's suppose the system is in some state of psi, and then we can 
they define so-called the reduced density matrix by, by tracing out, say, the Hilbert space, say, of the two. Okay, and then, uh, and then in this state psi, you, uh, you take this uh, density operator corresponding to psi, and then you trace out all the degrees freedom, say, say in system two, and then you can get the density operator uh, which contain degrees freedom only in uh, system one. So this is called reduced density operator. And then this contains information. So this row one contains a lot of information about say quantum correlations between one, two, uh, and entanglement, et cetera. Okay. For example, one of the most commonly used measure of entanglement uh, is the volume entropy for this row one. And so this captures, uh, so this gives a, a, a measure for the, um, for the entanglement between say system one and two. Okay. In fact, uh, if you have a pure state and essentially uh, uh, this entanglement entropy uh, and essentially captures uh, it, essentially all the entanglement information between uh, uh, between one and the two, okay. Yeah, yeah, so this provides a, a measure of entanglement between one and two. And the key structure here is the factorization of the Hilbert space, okay. It said the Hilbert space can be factorized into tensor product of H1 and H2. So this, without this tensor product structure, then you will not be able to define a uh, 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 reduced density matrix. And without defining the reduced density matrix, of course, you cannot define entropy, et cetera, okay? And so, uh, so this structure is key. And now if you are interested in, uh, in entanglement in quantum field theory, as we all, uh, we, all uh, 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 we are mostly interested in, okay? Uh, uh, for say, for string theory or for, uh, um, yeah. And in the quantum field theory, such a factorization of Hilbert space actually does not exist, say in the continuum limit. Okay. So for example, let's consider, um, yeah, just the simplest situation. Say let's Im imagine we have a one, a one plus one dimensional uh, 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 quantum field theory uh, and, the, and the, this nine is the space. Yeah, the, uh, you should imagine that's infinite nine. And let's separate this, uh, uh, space by by L and R regions. Okay, so and uh, and uh, this dot is the region we separate into L and R. So you want to ask, you want to understand the entanglement between the L and R regions. Okay, say in the vacuum state. But unfortunately, in this case, the Hilbert space in the continuum limited the full Hilbert space of your uh, quantum field theory cannot be factorized. Into a uh, uh, into Hilbert space associated with the left region, and the Hilbert say, uh, space associated with the right region, and the, so uh, such a factorization does not exist. And then we cannot define reduced density matrix, say associated with either region, or we cannot dis uh, 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 we cannot define entanglement entropy between them. Okay. So, but in practice, what do we do? He said we cannot, even though we cannot do this in the continuum limits, but, but if we introduce a short distance cutoff, for example, if you uh, uh, put the system on the lattice, so here imagine you put the system on the lattice. Okay, so, uh, so each, yeah, uh, now you, uh, uh, with some lattice spacing. So, and in this case, then, uh, then once you put the system on the lattice, and now there's a lateral factorization because you can degree, uh, define degree freedom on each lattice point. And now there's a natural factorization of the Hilbert space uh, uh, between the right and the L. And now in this case, now you can define uh, 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 the uh, reduced density operator. You can define the entanglement entropy. And of course, this entanglement entropy will actually depend on the lattice spacing. Okay. And actually what happens is that in the continuum limit, when you take the lattice spacing A to zero, and you find that this entanglement actually goes to infinity. Okay. So what's happening in this situation is that in quantum field theory, there's actually too much entanglement, okay, in the continuum limit. That the, uh, 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 the usual notion of the entanglement entropy just breaks down. Okay, so, uh, so you can only define, say, say, by introducing some cutoff, and then you, then you regularize it, okay? But this entanglement entropy cannot, can actually not be renormalized 
because they always depend on the cutoff. Okay, and uh, uh, um, yeah, but of course the, we can already get lots of insights by uh, uh, by introducing the cutoff, etc. But still, we have this issue that there's no fundamental description uh, in terms of the entangled entropy. So in physics, normally when we encounter infinities, it usually means that we are not using the right language. Okay, so so when you are uh, uh, say uh, 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 see something which is infinite, so that means somehow uh, uh, we must not be able to yeah must not uh, 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 so this gives you new opportunities to uh, to think about your system in a different perspective. And here, this entanglement give us such a, 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 yeah, infinities. So, so actually now there's an alternative, which actually in my, own, in my opinion, a superior approach to capture, uh, uh, to capture entanglement in situations. Uh, there's too much entanglement, okay? Such that the usual notion of entanglement entropy is not very defined because it's infinite, okay? So in such a situation, actually, there's an alternative way to do it. And this is the using the volume algebra. Okay, it turns out that the volume algebra is actually precisely the right language to talk about such, uh, uh, such situations. Okay, so it's a little bit like, say in physics, when we think about symmetries. Yeah, symmetries and the, lead, uh, and the group theory it's just the precise the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the mathematical language to think about symmetries, and it turns out that this volume algebra is the the natural language, okay, the mathematical language uh, to think about entanglements. So in such kind of uh, situations with infinite entanglements, okay. So let me say a few words about just general uh, uh, remarks about uh, uh, volume algebras. So soon after the development of quantum mechanics. Say and it's a mathematical foundation using Hilbert space, uh, von Neumann and uh, uh, Murray say they initiated the task say of classifying operate algebras for all quantum systems. Okay. So, yeah, uh, 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 they they just yeah uh, from mathematician point of view it's very natural. Say for any quantum system you have operate algebras, and then then it's natural to classify them. Okay, so they didn't have in mind anything related to entanglement, etc. Uh, they just want to classify, uh, uh, yeah, classify algebras. And so we define algebras, but yeah, just uh, uh, in quantum mechanics, there's a natural way to define the algebras. You can add, uh, uh, you can linear superpose the operators, you can take a product of them. And then the only thing you need to do is to define a sense of closure. Okay, so, so how do you define the, uh, uh, the algebra is closed? So this is uh, some technical issues in doing that. So, uh, 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 so the, uh, yeah, so the way von Neumann uh, defined the closure, say of the operator algebras is that you require, say a sequence to be convergent. Say if the matrix elements uh, uh, are convergent. Okay, so that's how you define the convergence. And the, uh, the how you define the closure of the algebra. Yeah. Anyway, uh, and uh, so once you define uh, uh, once you define the closure of the algebra, then you can try to classify them. Okay. So it turns out that they can uh, classify this operator algebra in various types. And so the operator algebras we normally encounter in quantum mechanical classes. So if you have finite number de finite number of degrees freedom, say so the finite number of harmonic oscillators, etc., and they are all type one. Okay. So the type one algebra is just uh, yeah since the uh, we we see them every day we don't even uh, give uh, uh, give them a name called type one just uh, it, just the standard operator algebras. So so uh, but if you want to talk about the mathematically what's the mean uh, uh, what's the classification of a type one algebra, is that the projection operators in type one algebra they are all of integer ranks. So, so if you remember in your quantum mechanical classes, the projection operators are one that satisfy the p square equal to p. So, for example, this is a simple example. So, p square equal to p, and so this projection, uh, this is a projection to a one-dimensional uh, uh, Hilbert space. And so, this is a rank one projector. 
Okay, so if you have two orthogonal states, and then you get uh, a rank two projector. Okay, and uh, so so in our uh, uh, usual uh, 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 treatment of quantum mechanics, you only have uh, a projection operators of in, uh, uh, integer rank, so you can it can be up to integer number. Okay. But you can easily also write down the projectors of, of, of infinite rank. Okay, so if you allow a projector of infinite rank, and then how do we separate them? How do we classify them? Okay, and it turns out then the uh, 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 Mon and the uh, 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 Murray they realize actually you can actually generalize uh, the rank of a, 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 a projection operator to non-integers, okay? Essentially, it's to do some kind of normalization when you define the trace, okay? So, yeah, say so if you take it, so the rank of a projector can be uh, uh, defined just by taking the trace of this projector. And so this has a trace equal to one, this has trace equal to two, et cetera, okay? And so they find actually you can find some way, even for, uh, for projectors of infinite rank, they can find some way to redefine that rank to get a finite number, okay? They find that they can generalize it to, to non-integers, okay? And then using this kind of rank, then they can find, uh, then they find more exotic algebras, uh, which involving say those projectors of infinite rank, okay? And so then they, uh, they further can classify it into type two, uh, which the rank can be non-active real integer, or type three, which all projections are infinite ranks. Okay, so so in type two, uh, uh, your rank is still finite, but uh, but uh, but they can uh, be non non active re real number. Okay, For, and then you can classify them further, so they're called type two two one to subscript one. So so here you can try to normalize it so that all your rank is be, uh, is a real number between zero and one. And uh, and all you have type infinity, a type to infinity, which the rank is arbitrary real number from zero to infinity. Okay, and then in type three, and then all, all projections have uh, uh, have infinite rank. So now this this rank can no longer be used to classify the type three algebras, because just everything is infinite. Okay, again you have, and now you again you need the new language to talk about it because now everything become infinite. And, uh, and then, then using more sophisticated method, which I will mention briefly later, and this type three uh, monolumic algebra can be further classified. So into the type three zero, type three lambda, uh, which lambda is a pr uh, parameter between zero and one, and uh, then type three one. Okay, so I will not go into details uh, uh, in them. And, uh, and you, can, uh, you only need to keep in mind that there are just some exotic algebras uh, which can uh, has been classified. Okay, so um, so it turns out, yeah. So so in the early days, so von Riemann himself, he thought that this von Riemann algebra. He had high hopes that this von Riemann algebra, uh, this classification, can have very important applications in physics. And in particular, he had high hope for this type two algebras. So the type one algebras he said just too trivial, and type two algebras he thought would be uh, would be actually the right amount of complexity, okay, and should play a very important role in physics. And uh, then type three algebras uh, uh, just too exotic for him because he couldn't classify it, okay. So so this was also uh, was only later classified by uh, uh, by Alan Kong and other people. Anyway, but but Monuma himself didn't leave to see. Uh, the applications of either type two or type three algebras. Okay, so it took for a while, took for a long while for people to realize the importance. But now people realized in quantum statistical physics and quantum field theory, uh, type three, two and type three algebras are now found important applications, okay, in quantum statistical physics and quantum field theories. And uh, uh, as I will explain, actually they play a very important role in quantum field theories. So in fact, in relativistic quantum field series, the local operator algebra in any local region, R, say it's the type three one algebra. 
Okay. And so the simplest example, again, is this, uh, 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 let's just uh, uh, imagine you have the uh, one dimensional space and imagine uh, you can see the sub region corresponding to a half line. Okay. And then the operator algebra in this right or in the left region are type three one. Okay. So you just can see the all operators are localized in those regions. Okay. Uh, say take a free scalar field theory, just the uh, simplest free scalar field theory you learn uh, in day one in quantum field theory. And if you look at the operators which are localized in the right region, and then turns out they are type three one algebra. And uh, um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, also just uh, 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 the operator algebra in this region is also equivalent to the operator algebra, its causal complement. Yeah, just because of the causality. Uh, you can evolve the operator in its, its causal uh, 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 completion. And for, for half space like R, the causal completion is just a window space time. So, so the operator algebra in the windowless space time is also type three one, okay. And so I will not go into details uh, of what is type three one. And let me just mention that the uh, type three one captures infinite entanglement between the right and the L region, okay. And also this type three one is crucial, okay, uh, for the uh, for uh, for existence of sharp causal structure. So we know that in relativistic quantum uh, field theory, we have sharp causal structure, we have sharp light cones. And you can show that in order to have sharp light cones and the, uh, the operator algebra have to be type three one. Okay. And so, uh, so this type three one actually plays a crucial uh, 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 role uh, in, uh, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, causality. Okay. And so, so type two algebras are a little bit more uh, uh, elastic exotic, uh, but they uh, uh, they appear in many quantum statistical systems. Okay, but they all in, uh, appear in systems with infinite number degrees freedoms. Uh, and when you have a finite, when you only have finite number degrees freedom, it's always type one. Okay, uh, whatever algebra you can have, it's always type one. So so they only appears in the um, yeah say a uh, 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 system with infinite number degrees freedom. Good. Any questions so far? Good. So, so the uh, then the type one algebra, uh, yeah. So now let me, uh, 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 let me just say a few words to contrast. So these three types of algebras. Yeah, you glow this sentence so far. Uh, so this type one algebra is what we normally uh, see. Say you have a factorization of the Hilbert space associated with it, and uh, yeah, just uh, and they have standard definition of trace. And they have they always have finite entanglement entropy. Okay, so the so these are the standard language we normally talk about entanglement. But for uh, for type two algebras, in this case already there's no factorization of Hilbert space associated with such an algebra. But in this case, as uh, uh, I mentioned, you can define a renormalized trace. So even though if you use the standard trace to define the rank of the projectors, there you just get infinite. But you can actually define a renormalized trace at which case the finite number. So in this case, we have infinite entanglement. But now using this renormalized trace, uh, but the entanglement entropies, but the entanglement entropy differences between different states are finite. So if you imagine you have a Hilbert space, and if you look at the uh, uh, entanglement entropy between the uh, between subsystem, say uh, in any state, you find that they are infinite. But but now if you can, but now if you consider the difference of the entanglement entropy between the different states, actually they become finite. So that's the reason you can actually define. Uh, and uh, so and then you can now if you remove an infinite of all constants, uh, and then you can define entropy associated with each state. Okay, Be because of the uh, 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 you just have an infinite constant associated with all states. Once you remove that infinite constant and the rest. Uh, is finite. So in this case, we can actually define a renormalized entropy, which is finite. Okay. And the more exotic situation is this type three. So here, there's no factorization field of space. You cannot define a trace. And though there's uh, infinite entanglement. So, so not only you have infinite entanglement for each state, 
But also the difference of the entanglement entropy uh, among the states are also infinite. So, so just everything is infinite, okay? So in this case, just no entropy can be defined. And this is a, a precisely the situation for relativistic quantum field theory and the exacture, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, which is required for, uh, 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 from causality. Yeah, so this is three layers of the entanglement, okay? Uh, uh, three layers of entanglement. And but, but in type three case, even though there's no uh, a trace, there's no entropy can be defined, but there's alternative structure to characterize entanglement. Okay, so now let me very quickly to talk about this alternative structure. I will not have time to go into detail here. And uh, 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 let me just say it quickly. Again, let's go back to this uh, 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 type one situation. Uh, which you have the standard story, say, of defining a reduced density matrix, et cetera. Okay. But now in this case, if row one, row two, so, so you can define a reduced density operator for subsystem one, and you can similarly define a reduced density operator for subsystem two by, by, uh, by, uh, by taking the, uh, uh, the trace in system one. Okay. In the case which row one and row two are invertible, Okay, it means they become, yeah, means they have full rank. Yeah, for finite dimension the Hilbert space, they just have a, a means they are full rank. But, the, but you can also define this for infinite dimension of Hilbert space. Okay. And turns out when they are invertible, there's additional structure. Okay, so before saying this additional structure, let me mention just that this invertible, for row one, row two to be invertible, actually they have to be highly entangled. Okay, uh, uh, so if you have a finite dimensional Hilbert space, that means they are full rank. Full rank means they're highly entangled. Okay, because the, for example, say if row one is proportional to identity, and then that means it's maximally entangled. Okay, and say if row one is a pure state, which is rank one, which clearly uh, 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 not, say, uh, um, yeah, not invertible. So in this case, it's not entangled. Okay, so, so, so the full rank, uh, uh, come in, in, in the invertible in the situation which you are highly entangled. Okay. It turns out when row one and row two are invertible, then you can define something called the modular flow. Okay, you can define a so-called modular operator. So delta defined to be row two and times row one inverse. Okay, and this, yeah, you see this structure only exists when, uh, when they have inverse, okay, they can be inverted. And, uh, and then you can now, uh, so this is a Hermitian operator. And now you can use it to, to generate a flow. Okay, you can take the logarithm of it and then, and then exponentiate it. And now you can uh, generate a one parameter family of unitary flow okay, using this operator. It turns out that this operator have very, uh, this flow have very, uh, 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 yeah, so this is called modular flow. So this, uh, 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 say, say if we uh, denote all the operator uh, denote all the operator of subsystem one, say as B H one, and then then it's obvious that the uh, the flow, say if you act this flow uh, uh, on the operator in B H one, it take you still inside the B H one. It's because row two commute with any operator here, and then when you act delta. Uh, any operator in subsystem one and the row two just cancel, okay? Because you take the inverse here, they just cancel. And then obviously the row one uh, is part of the BH1 and they take the system with it still, okay? And similarly, uh, it, it satisfies this condition uh, uh, B2, okay? And uh, so, uh, uh, so you can also do this conversely. If there exists a, a modular operator, satisfy this kind of property, then we can say this system must be highly entangled. Okay, uh, it must be entirely entangled. And now for type three algebra, you can no longer define reduced density matrix. So there's no lotion of the row one or row two, et cetera. But it turns out this delta, okay, uh, exists. So for type three volume algebras, uh, you can define the delta, okay, using some other way. Okay, you can define such an operator delta uh, and this uh, flow generated by delta still have this property and now become a highly non-trivial property. We take the sub-algebra 
uh, uh, of the system into itself. Okay, and uh, and then now the entanglement structure is captured by the existence of this modular flow operator and by the property of this uh, 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 modular pro, uh, flow operator. Uh, uh, and in fact, that's how people actually classify the type three one, uh, type three algebras. So as I mentioned, you can uh, classify type three algebras in type three zero, type three lambda, type three one. And by using the properties of the modular flow operator, and then you can further classify it. And those properties of the modular flow operator, again, captures the different type of entanglements. Okay, again, a, a capture a different type of entanglements. But now since every, uh, uh, but now since all this uh, entanglement entropy, all these things are infinite, you cannot use it using the entropy. But now using the modular flow operator, you can classify the different entanglements uh, 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 in your system. Okay. And uh, so, uh, uh, so in the sense that the, uh, uh, yeah, just to summarize, so in the sense that this volume algebra structure is really uh, the very natural language, uh, which for us to capture highly non-trivial entanglement structure, which you cannot normally capture using your standard language, okay. So uh, uh, to finish this part of the uh, 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 background, uh, do you have any uh, uh, questions? So Hong, um, maybe we we'll see it after for the holography, but how do you define the operator, the modular operator in general? Like if I give you some generic QFT, you know, with some scalar field fermions, how do you construct from uh, Delta? Right, right. Yeah, yeah, that's a, um, yeah, that's a very, in general, it's a very difficult question. Uh, uh, in general, it's a very difficult question, but there's a powerful mathematical theorem prove that it always exists, okay? Yes. Uh, it proved that it always exists. So in most situations, you don't, you don't have to know the explicit form of this modular operator. You just say the theorem guarantee that they exist. And then now you can just use this property to do lots of things. Uh, and, uh, and essentially, that's how mathematicians they, uh, 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 they do it. And they use this to classify different algebras. They do lots of other things. And you only need to know the existence. And then, and then, and then you can already use it to do lots of things. Okay. And of well, course, for, uh, for physics, it's always good to know, uh, 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 to know it explicitly. Hmm. But in special situations, for example, if you have windowless space time, and then we do know it explicitly, just given by the boost operator. Okay. And, so, uh, and uh, uh, what it does, it should uh, generate the boost. So what is the recipe to, to build it? Like, I mean, how do you know it should be the boost uh, operator? Right, yeah, yeah. So yes, I didn't uh, 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 have time to say here. Essentially, this module operator satisfies several properties. So first is, uh, 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 this has to be an automorphism of your algebra. Say so you, uh, you act on the algebra, it takes uh, the algebra to itself. And if you act the, the commutant of the algebra, also take the commutant of the algebra to itself. And also, if you look at the flow generated by this uh, uh, modular operator, and the flow as if uh, this is a finite temperature. So, uh, so uh, the flow satisfies so called KMS uh, uh, conditions. And so, so, so if you can prove or operate or satisfy those conditions, and then essentially that uniquely determines that you be mm. the modular flow operator. Okay. And that's how you can prove it for the, uh, uh, for the boost. So the boost, yeah. Uh, so the boost uh, certainly is the uh, is automorphism uh, of the algebra in the window space time because it does not take you outside the window patch. And also we do know from the unruh story that the uh, the uh, the correlation functions uh, uh, under the uh, 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 in the window uh, in the window time uh, actually is thermal. Uh, 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 so this is the KMS property satisfied by the modular operator. Yeah, yeah. So 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 here just from this unruh story, and we know that the boost operator must be the modular hmm. operator. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. For more general story, uh, 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 it's much more complicated to construct it. Actually, there are very few examples which you can construct it explicitly. And on, um, on Minkowski, is it known or? 
Sorry? If you take Minkowski space time, is it known? For the full space time, uh, it's just trivial. I mean, also, it's like some, some patch of Minkowski. Yeah, yeah, from patch of Minkowski, uh, you, uh, you only know, say, uh, you only know for Rindler. Okay, just Rindler, okay. Yeah, you only know for Rindler in the vacuum state. Okay. And uh, then, then, then if you have a conformal field theory, and then, and then, uh, then for diamond region, then it's known. Okay. But then other that, yeah, other that is not known. Yeah, explicit form is not known. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, but we know it exists. And, uh, and if you know it exists, then you can use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, Hong. Can I ask yeah. a question? Sure. Uh, and if everything that you said is about like a local QFTs, right? The locality is the necessary or like a, does it also work for like a non-local theories? Uh, so the algebra structure does not uh, refer to anything local. It just it just happens for QFT. Uh, there's a lot uh, the natural things we we are interested in the QFT is just the algebra in the local region. Yeah, because uh, it turns out that they are uh, type three. Yeah. Yeah, because what say that the, like I I want to do this for string field theory. Right. And you know, we don't have a like a well defined operator like, or even like yeah we don't have an operator notion in string filter. We only have this pat integral and that's so. all. So how can I cast this language into the pat integral or like a get it from pat integral? Do you, do you have any idea or not? Right, so so normally, so normally when you have a path integral, you can translate them into the operator language. Uh, 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 it's a little bit more formal, uh, but yeah, but say if you look at the correlation function uh, in the path integral, and they always translate into some time, say, uh, some ordered correlation function of some operators. So, so, mm -hmm. Yeah, so in the sense that the path integral does ca capture the operator algebra structure, because, yeah, if you look at the string field, it's an operator. Well, I mean, it's not, right? Like, because the way we think about it is that we say, okay, there is a configuration space, but there is like a uh, Hilbert space of 2D CFD, and we take yeah. it. And we just define it to be like a, in the BV sense, right? Then we say, okay, this is like a one form in a big configuration space. But like, I don't, I don't know any well-defined notion that you write correlators in this BV integral sense and associate a, uh, associate a like operator formalism. So oh, if, yeah. yeah, you can certainly do it because the BV, the BV is used to quantize a constraint theory, right? And using uh, using BV, you can in principle just quantize that theory. Yeah, that's correct. So you also say that the, based on the correlators that are obtained, I can create a like operator formalism and do this like a classification. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I think actually, uh, I think actually, uh, uh, this kind of algebraic language is very natural for stream field mm -hmm. theory. So there, you cannot really talk about some geometric region, etc sub-region, but I think that there's a, uh, uh, say you can use use BV to quantize your theory. And then then there's a very large notion of the operator algebras. I see. Yeah. I see. And, uh, and then, so, yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. So, so so this concludes my discussion for, for, for that part. And now let's, now let me say a few words uh, about the uh, uh, holography in the large N image. And again, I suspect this structure should be very useful for stream field theory because the, uh, yeah, because the, um, say if you take the inequality for super young male theory, say at weak coupling, we believe that it's dual to some, some string theory in the box. Okay, uh, uh, some string theory in the box. And uh, 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 and the most natural way to describe that string theory in the box is uh, uh, some string field theory, and uh, so the so the ink for super young male theory we coupling essentially is due to that string field theory. Good. So so here is just very quick summer, summary slide about the general structure of the duality. So here you have the box gravity theory to be equivalent to some boundary CFT. 
And then in the box, the gravity theory, the most crucial parameter, say, is G Newton. And that is due to one of n, and n is some number with you. N is, uh, 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 n is some, uh, yeah, it's a number which characterizes the number of degree freedom in the CFT. And then the semi classical limit on the gravity side corresponding to G Newton goes to zero. And then that's corresponding to angle to infinity on the field series side. And then the fundamental fields here. So here, including the stream fields, okay, not only the gravity fields, only including stream fields, uh, uh, all the stringy excitations. So the fundamental fields here, defined in the stream sense, are dual to single trace operators. So there's one to one correspondence between single trace operators and the uh, uh, string excitations, okay. And uh, um, and then the quantum state, there's a one-to-one -one co correspondence between the quantum states on both sides. And if you have a quantum state in the uh, 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 gravity theory, then, then there must be a corresponding quantum state in the boundary CFT. So on the gravity side, we know that when you take the G Newton goes to zero limit, for certain subsets, okay, uh, actually uh, likely very small subset of quantum states, they actually have a well-defined G Newton goes to zero limit, and then they give rise to classical geometry. Okay, so in general, so if you look at generic quantum state, you expect they don't have a well-defined G Newton goes to zero limit, uh, which they don't map to smooth classical geometry. Okay, and so 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 we expect there's some small subset of states in the G Newton goes to zero limit. They should go to classical geometry, and so this is the classical uh, a classical geometry is the the classical description of uh, uh, the uh, such a quantum state in this limit. So our main question is to understand how does this classical geometry and all these geometric concepts and the geometric notions associated with the classical geometry arise in the angle to the infinite limit in the boundary CFT description. So if you take such a state, in the in the CFT, somehow when you take angle to infinity limits, such kind of geometric notion should arise. Okay, and uh, so this has been a mystery so far. Okay, so so we want to develop a language uh, to understand it conceptually. Good. So so let me just say a few further words. So geometric notions, such as local space time regions horizons and uh, are strictly defined only in the G Newton goes to lim uh, zero limit. So if you have a finite N, the quantum space-time fluctuations make such geometric concept fuzzy, okay? So we, so we uh, right now we don't actually have a proper language to describe this uh, regime of finite G Newton, okay? So, so here I want to make an analog with the phase transition, say statistical physics. Okay, so, so uh, uh, yeah, phase transition is something very familiar to us, but, but to define phase transition precisely, okay, you have to take the so-called thermodynamic limit. You have to take the infinite volume limit to keep your density fixed. Okay, only in that limit, the long, line, long analytic behavior, say associated with a, uh, uh, associated with a phase transition arises, and that's the only regime we can talk about phase transition in precise terms, in precise mathematical language. Okay, but of course, in real life, all phase, uh, all systems are, are in the finite volume, so. So in real life, when we uh, uh, use phase transition to describe experiments, we actually using the infinite volume language to describe finite volume physics. Okay, so so here we expect that the same thing may happen. Okay, in the uh, uh, in in gravity. Okay, so so once we understand precisely what happens in the G Newton goes to zero limit, where we can talk about those kind of geometric notions in a sharp way. Once we understand that, 
And then we will be able to describe those notions at the finite G Newton in the in, in somewhat approximate way. Okay, so the uh, uh, the real life experiment is only approximately, uh, yeah, the phase transition they are approximate. Okay, and uh, uh, but the key is you have to understand that this G Newton goes to zero limit first. And uh, so, um, yeah, so the questions of uh, emergence and the space time can only be formulated sharply in the G Newton goes to zero limit. And which translates into n go to infinity limit of the boundary theory. So, 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 an important step in understanding this is to pinpoint the precise mathematical structure, okay, that is responsible for the emergence of the geometric notions, okay. Yeah, because in order, so if I give you just some kind of field theory. The, uh, there's no emergent space time in it, okay? So somehow if you want to see this precise geometric notion associated with the bulk, there must be some new mathematical structure which arises in the angle to infinity limit. So, so if we can pinpoint that precise mathematical structure and then, then that's equivalent to understanding the how space and time and all this, all those geometric notions arise. Okay. And I want to advocate that emerging the mathematical structure is the ubiquitous emergence of type three y monomial algebras in the uh, 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 in the larger limit. Okay. So so what happens when you take and go to infinite limit? There emerges many of this kind of type three y monomial algebras. Okay, so so um, yeah, so now, now let me say a few words about the large n limit of the duality. So so it's always good to keep some examples in mind. For example, in for super Yamil theory, with gauge group S U M. Um, so uh, so many states and operators they don't yeah. So, so in the large n limit, many states and operator don't have a well-defined large n limit, okay. And that means, in the large n limit, you should only focus on those states and operators which do have well-defined limit. And if you restrict to only to those operators and to only to those states. Then that means the structures of the Hilbert space and operate algebras, they can undergo dramatic changes. Okay, in the larger limit. Okay, let me give you a simple example. Let's consider just you have a lattice. Again, we have one dimensional space. Now, first imagine you consider the theory, uh, the system is on the lattice. Okay. And then, and then uh, we consider when we take the lattice space and go to zero, we go to continuum limit. Okay, we consider, yeah, say a quantum field theory on the lattice and then we take a continuum limit. So, so in the discrete case, as I mentioned before, if you consider some right region, and then there's a, a factorization of the Hilbert space, so associated with the right region and the left region, and you can factorize them. And then the algebra associated with the right region Say I call AR is a type one algebra. But now when you take the uh, uh, the continuum linear, uh, uh, when you take A go to zero, it turns out the Hamilton, uh, uh, the Hilbert space is no longer factorizable. And this AR become type three one. So how does that happen? That happens for uh, uh, heuristically for a simple reason is that, so if you look at this discrete theory, this Hilbert space contain many, many states, okay, and many, many operators. But now when you take A go to zero limit, when you take a continuum limit, and the energy of the states of many states in this Hilbert space depend on A. And when you take A go to zero limit, those energy become infinite. And also the definition of uh, many operators, the action of many operators can also depend on A. And when you take O to, 
equal to zero limit and the sum of those operates no longer well defined. The action of those operates no longer well defined. So in the continuum limits, only those states which have a finite energy in the continuum limit survive. And those states corresponding to the states which are in the uh, original Hilbert space, uh, 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 those states which are not factorizable. Okay. And then that also changes the nature of the, your, uh, your operator algebra. Okay. So I want to argue similar things happen when you take the large n limit. When you take the large n limit, many, many states in your Hilbert space, they just have infinite energy, they just decouple. And it, again, uh, the action of many operators uh, is no longer well defined. And again, they sh should be thrown away. And then that's change your uh, 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 operator structure, yeah, operator algebra structure. And, uh, and so, so one key thing I emphasize is that uh, when you have type one in the discrete case, there's no sharp light cone. And in this case, there's sharp light cone. So, so the emergence of a sharp causality, okay, in the discrete, uh, in the continuum limit, in the quantum field theory, very much has to do with this emergence of type three one algebra in the continuum limit, say of a QFT. Okay, so uh, uh, so if you are analytic, you never have a sharp light cone. Okay, there's always some exponential tail can can leak way outside of the light cone. Okay, so so we see that this kind of structure is actually crucial for the emergence of the, sh the sharp causality. Okay. Not approximate causality. On the lattice, already have a, uh, approximate causality. But for uh, uh, if you have want to have sharp lotion of causality, then you must have this uh, long factorizable structure and the type of, uh, three one algebra. Okay. So so now let's talk about the uh, uh, now let's look at the operator algebra in the large n limit. So we say an operator has a sensible large n limit. If it's vacuum correlation functions have a well-defined uh, uh, angle to infinity limit, okay. So essentially, we can define an operator by the angle to infinity limit of its correlation functions, okay. So that ensures uh, uh, it's uh, uh, at least act sensibly on the vacuum states, okay. And uh, so, so for for example, for an angle for super Yamil theory. And that just gives you the finite product of single trace operators. So many very complicated operators, uh, they just decouple, okay? They just disappear from your uh, operator spectrum. And then, then they form an algebra in the large n limit, okay? So we call it the single trace operator algebra. So I don't have much time to describe the, uh, how we define this operator algebra in detail. Let me just mention two important elements of it. So one element is that in order to define the single, per, uh, single trace operator algebra, you actually need to use the state information. So normally in quantum mechanics, the operator algebra can be defined independent of the state. Okay. But in the large limit, in order to define this algebra, you actually need to uh, 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 include the information of the state. So this operator algebra actually are state dependent. So if you can see the different states, they are, uh, their properties can be very, very different. So we will see examples later, okay. So, so this algebra is state dependent. And also another key thing is that single trace operators at different times are independent. So let me now elaborate the second point a little bit further. So let's imagine you have a causal diamond, okay? And now let's look at two Cauchy slices of this causal diamond. And say, if you are in the ordinary QFT or in the finite N, then the operator algebra associated with these two Cauchy slices, which I call A1 and A2, they're just completely equivalent, okay? They're not only isomorphic, uh, Isomorphic, they are equivalent in the sense that the, any operator in A2 can be expressed in terms of linear superposition of operators in A1. Okay, so this is obvious because from the Heisenberg uh, uh, evolution. Okay, so, so any operator here, uh, uh, you can just go to its past light cone 
and then then express in terms of operating a one and vice versa. So physically, these two operate algebra are completely equivalent. So they are just identical. Okay, they're just uh, uh, can be expressed in terms of each other. But at the infinite n, the algebra of single trace operators, you can no longer express them uh, 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 in terms of each other. Because at the finite n, say a single trace operator in A2, then can be expressed in terms of the operators in A1. But when you take the large n limits, some of those operators, they drop out of the spectrum because only single trace operator uh, uh, survives. And then, and then that operator can no longer be expressed just in terms of the single trace operator because those are the more complicated operators which you need to express A2 in terms of A1, uh, they drop out. So now A2 and A1, they become independent algebras. So, so even though this is a very simple point, but this gives you a much, much richer structure in the large n limit compared to the finite n. Because now you have many, many more possible sub-algebras. Okay. Good. Yeah, so this is the uh, story for the uh, uh, operate algebras. Now, uh, uh, let me now also say a few words about large n limit of the Hilbert space. So the many states don't have a well-defined large n limit. And the states, so we, uh, 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 we define a state has a well-defined large limit, uh, limit if correlation functions of single trace operators, okay, with expectation values subtracted, you need to have a well-defined angle to infinite limit. Okay. So, so we already defined the single trace operators as well-defined uh, uh, well operator in the large n limit. And then we can use this to define those states which survive in the large n limit. Okay, so 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 those are the states which that single trace operator have well defined correlation functions. And so uh, uh, yeah, so so we refer to a state with a well defined uh, large n limit and the certain factorization properties as a semi classical state. And we are not going to details of that. Anyway, so so the bottom line is, is that now we can define states. Using their correlation, uh, using large n limits, uh, limit of their correlation functions. Okay, so 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 including the vacuum, some of your uh, some thermal density operator, some of your double state, you can define them uh, 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 this way. Okay, so their microscopic definition no longer makes sense. Okay, and then for semi-classical state psi, then we can build a Hilbert space around it by acting the uh, finite product of single trace operator on it. And, uh, and you can uh, uh, define this uh, uh, strictly. So this is called uh, uh, GNS Hilbert space. GNS is uh, just a, a mathematical procedure to, to, to prove that this is actually a, a well-defined Hilbert space. Okay, so, so, so we just call this GNS Hilbert space. So in the large n limits, only semi-classical states and the uh, 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 states around them survive. Okay, so this implies in the large n limit, the full Hilbert space actually splits into disconnected GNS Hilbert spaces around semi-classical states. Okay, so 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 essentially, you don't have a single Hilbert space structure. You have uh, just disconnected uh, uh, Hilbert spaces, and the different side leads to different single trace operators, algebra, and a, a, a very different mathematical properties, etc. And the same structure appears on the gravity side. Because on the gravity side, we just essentially quantize gravity around the geometry to obtain the Fox space around that geometry. So the same story applies to stream field theory. So in the stream field theory, you find the solution, say, to stream field theory equation motion. And then you build your Hilbert space around that solution. OK? So, so, uh, uh, um, so essentially, you have this kind of disconnected uh, Hilbert space uh, around each stream field theory solutions. Okay, uh, uh, that's the structure in the G Newton uh, uh, G, uh, G string goes to zero limit. Yeah, which is the map to this Nagy limit we are talking about right now. Okay, so, so let me just summarize 
uh, the structure of the holographic duality in the large n limits. So, so you have a uh, one to one correspondence between the, the state which have well defined uh, 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 G-Luton goes to zero limit and the geometry, uh, a large n limit and the geometry. And then there's mapping between the GNS Hilbert space uh, around the states and the fork space around the geometry. And then, of course, you should also have operate algebra. Uh, uh, the operate algebra acting on the GNS Hilbert space and the fork space, they should also match. And uh, yeah, uh, here I'm just using the, uh, uh, now using this notation, uh, M psi and M psi tilde to denote the uh, operate algebra in the boundary and in the bulk. Okay. And in the bulk, in the G Newton goes to zero limit, uh, 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 in the boundary theory, in the large n limit, uh, these are described by a gen uh, uh, this operate algebra generalized, are generated by generalized free field in the leading order in the large n limit. On the, on the gravity side, they're just generated by free fields, okay, free gravity fields, free stream fields, say, say in the G, uh, G string goes to zero limit. So the structure is that you have this kind of disconnected Hilbert space, say associated with each a semi-classical state, and then then uh, then uh, then the map to yeah. Uh, so this is just the mapping, uh, a cartoon of the mapping from the gravity and the the, uh, the field theory side. Okay. So um, yeah. Um, so now with this preparation. And now it's trivial to formulate this uh, sub algebra and sub region duality. So now we can formulate the duality for a box sub region. So now let's just consider a corresponding complete uh, uh, box space time region B. So now I'm talking about in the gravity uh, regime, okay, we are corresponding to the uh, field theory in the strongly coupled limit, big, because I don't know how to talk about this corresponding complete box region in the string field theory language yet. So, so the Bach field operator algebra, say in B is type three one, okay? And because, because here we are looking at the leading order in the G-Luton goes to zero limit. So you think you have a quantum field theory in curve space time. And if you have a quantum field theory in curve space time, then the Bach field, theory, uh, Bach field operator algebra in some space time region, it just type three one. This is just, I mentioned earlier, just in quantum field, in right basic quantum field theory, uh, uh, you always have type three one algebra associated with any local region. So, so this type three one algebra associated with this local region in the bulk is a sub algebra of the full operator algebra in the bound uh, in the bulk. Okay. But now I remember. But now recall that this full operator algebra in the bulk. Is identical to the full operator algebra in the boundary theory around this GNS Hilbert space. So there must be a one to one identification between the sub algebras. Okay. So that means there must exist emergent type 3 1 uh, volume algebra in the boundary theory, okay, which is sub algebra in the boundary theory, which is identified with this box sub algebra. Okay, so so this uh, so this establishes the one direction of the duality. You said any sub algebra, any sub region in the bulk, you can associate a sub algebra in the boundary theory. Okay, and you can actually uh, I will not have time to do it here. You can actually actually argue such a kind of algebra don't exist at finite n, in general don't exist at finite n. So so they are really emergent in the larger n limit. So conversely, we would like to conjecture any type three one sub algebra that exists some bulk region B, which is identified. Okay. So, so as I mentioned, that the type three one algebra implies some kind of causal structure. Okay. So it's natural to conjecture somehow that any say abstract type three one algebra in the boundary theory, somehow can be realized geometrically uh, in terms of some kind of a, a, a bulk region. Okay. So, so now we can talk about 
say, now if you imagine you have some general bark region that's not, yeah, some bark region B, and then there's a bark algebra by tilde B associated with this region. And then we identified with some sub algebra Y in the boundary theory. And now, now there's a, pro a paradigm which we can use this to describe the geometric notions uh, 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 of various uh, geometric properties associated with this subreach. Say, for example, the interior time of B then can be described by the modular flow of Y. Okay, so Y is the boundary sub algebra. Okay, so remember the modular flow is the automorphism of the algebra itself. Okay, that's what a, a precisely interior time do in the in the in the in the in the local region. Okay, interior time just take you a uh, uh, region to itself. Okay, and so essentially it's the automorphism of the algebra in that region. And you can, and then the global flow, which can take you outside B, and then this is related to some other structure uh, associated with the type three algebra, uh, which is called half-sided modular flow. We, yeah, we'll not have time to, uh, to, uh, to introduce this half-sided modular flow, but anyway, there's some other structure say associated with type three algebra, and then can be described with some global time, say uh, uh, outside the region. And then the causal structure, to go out, uh, associate with this uh, region, then can be described from non-analytic behavior, say under uh, uh, this half-sided modular flow. And uh, and the given y, yeah. Anyway, so uh, and then uh, then if you give me the uh, the boundary subalgebra, and I uh, in principle I can fully construct this block region. So finding these modular flows. And these half-sided modular flows, they are highly technically non-trivial questions, but they are powerful mathematical theorems which uh, prove their existence, okay? And so even though in general, we don't know them explicitly, say you cannot write them down explicitly, but you can actually work out their properties uh, uh, depend on uh, uh, different situations. Okay. So yeah, so, uh, so example, which illustrate this paradigm is this uh, emerging times and the horizons uh, 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 for internal black hole. Yeah, I see I'm already uh, 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 doing uh, pretty late. So I can actually in principle pause here. So if you have questions, uh, 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 I can uh, try to answer, yeah, more. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I can just stop here, uh, uh, because the um, yeah, it takes uh, a little bit time to talk about this emergent time and the horizon story. But but I, I think I have conveyed to you the essence of it. I have conveyed to you the essence of it, uh, the power of this algebraic language, and uh, yeah, yeah, I believe this, this uh, uh, yeah, this is a question I'm very interested in. Is that the uh, I believe this kind of language provides a very natural way to think about string field theory, and actually, uh, 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 yeah, because the key thing is that you don't actually even have to construct the algebra explicitly. So if you just have some abstract way to define the algebra, then can define abstractly its properties. Then there are, there's already a lot of mathematical theorems you can use, it can tell you the entanglement between the different subsystems in string theory, et cetera. And, and the work will be very powerful because, because we know that the string field theory, uh, a, a very difficult thing is that to, to write down many things explicitly. But the power of this formalism is that many things you don't need to do explicitly. And uh, they already, uh, a mathematical statement tell you certain things exist. And you can uh, uh, just using the abstract language can already take you very far. Yeah. Thanks, Howard Hong. Uh, so I have a question. I mean, I think it's, it's related to what uh, Atakan was asking. So to me, it looks as you said that 
string filter. In many cases, we cannot do explicit computation, but we can still prove general things like, you know, crossing symmetry, unitarity, and so on. So it looks like here entanglement should be something similar we can investigate. Uh, the main problem is, as that I can ask, how, like, it's how we define the operator algebra from the path integral or from the BV algebra, because it's not exactly the same uh, like objects which we have uh, in both cases. And uh, so I, I never see, so any place uh, where we can use uh, BV to get operators, we can like recover commutators and this kind of thing. So, so do you know some uh, like literature or something which discusses uh, some example or how to do it? Right, so so in the context of string field theory, I'm not sure. Mm. Even QFT like BV for a normal, you know, Stop. Right. QFT so, would be already some example to see how to move from BV to some more operator language. Right. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah. So, for example, in the, yeah, for example, in the just in the long opinion, Yang Mill theory, of course, BV would be an overkill for, uh, for, uh, for standard long opinion, Yang Mill theory. And, but there you can already do for this for powerful you can introduce goals, you can do BST. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there you can certainly just translate that into standards uh, or operator language, and even though it does not use the full uh, structure of the BB, and but still, um, yeah, the translation there is pretty straightforward. Yeah. But I, I would say in that case, I could see it uh, happening with a too much trouble because in young mirrors at least you you have a position space representation and yeah. and so you can quite easily write you know like the Hamiltonian and operators but we don't really have this in string field theory yeah but but in string field theory you do have the string field right mm -hmm. you do have the string field defined in the sense as a classical field yes. so so anytime you have a classical field you can just directly promote it into a uh, into a quantum operator. Uh, it, it, you can just define the operator algebra associated with that uh, field, and uh, and then then the precise rule of the operator algebra, of course, will depend on some quantum notion of it, etc. But uh, but at least then uh, then the uh, uh, then the abstract notion of the operator algebra already exists. Yes, but but the way we formulate the string filter is by working with a string field written as a CFT state. So if yeah. you want to to like extract the field itself, um, historically people have found it very hard to manipulate it. So there are some old paper from, for example, from Torn, but it was like it, it was becoming very messy when you wanted to really work with a field or, or the quantized field. So with respect to the uh, CFT state. Right, right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, indeed. So, so I think the the, the current way. Yeah, but still, <clears throat> still. Uh, um, uh, I think a specific CFT states it just used to define the object, mm. but it, but you can abstract it. Just imagine the existence of abstract CFT, and then 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 this this kind of abstract notion. Uh, uh, yeah, I think maybe even uh, saying and the button, they may even have written papers in in nineties, which they try to use this more abstract language. But but I think that they they didn't quite use the uh, talking about operate algebra. But I think they are already trying to use this kind of language. Mm -hmm. And also, I think Riton has written paper. He actually. Yeah, because once you think about string field theory, uh, think about string fields, then it's very natural to to attach, say, one new algebra to it. Mm -hmm. So I think a written actually written papers in in early nineties, I think, which he tried to uh, uh, attach some kind of operator algebra structure to it. He may even attempt it to use one new algebra. Mm -hmm. So so. I know he had a paper, I think, in 86 on the so supersymmetric SFT, where he tries to define the notion of a covariant phase space. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know what he did later with this, but, but yeah, he, it would be a starting point to define some operator algebra. 
Right, right. Yeah, he has something later. Certainly, it's, uh, I think it's the paper I have in mind. I think there are some papers in the late 80s or early 90s okay. uh, uh, of which he tried to do this. Uh, I forgot the papers, but but certainly he has written papers on this kind of. Uh, he also considered some toy models, mm. uh, not the full string theory. He actually brought some toy models, etc. Yeah. If by any chance you find the uh, reference writer, can you send it to me? Uh, yeah, yeah. Certainly. And I guess Atakan would be interested. Right, right. Certainly, yeah. Yeah, certainly I'd be very happy to talk about those papers. Yeah, mm. yeah. I think I look at those papers at one point, I need to. Uh, 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 yeah, uh, refined them. Yeah. Maybe also another way to approach the problem would be if, if you take so the, the CFT state, which is a superposition of uh, so many, like all the state in the CFT and the components of the space time field in momentum space. Mm -hmm. Maybe one way would be to promote this component to like operators and then find some object which takes the two CFT states and return like the bracket. Mm -hmm. so something mm -hmm. which evaluates the CFT state with this quantum components and, and compute. I don't know if it's doable, but. Uh... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 So, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, I, I, I also need to think about this question uh, uh, more explicitly. I have not sorted about it very carefully. I just uh, previously, I just. Uh, um, thought somehow should not be too difficult to do this, but I uh, I really have not really uh, thought it very carefully. Uh, yeah, yeah, just mostly uh, uh, intuition, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually I have a related comment on this. So, you know, in string field theory, we have this homotopy products, right? Like uh, this HCFD not only comes with a, like a algebra, but it should like, there should be like a well-defined products less uh, string fields so you mm -hmm. know it's a, a structure on top of it should be a structure top of the von neumann algebra right oh so, yeah so how should we like uh, see that like if if there's a correspondence between those two definitely in the like say i write a string theory on ads and then the, there should be some notion of like homotopy homotopy von neumann algebra in the boundary right like there should be additional products between the algebras and like the, their related homotopies. Right, right, right. Yeah. So, so, so the volume algebra is much more cruder. It's a much cruder uh, description of the algebra itself. Uh, for example, if you look at the CFT, yeah, just look at the conformal field theory, and then uh, and then if you look at the local region uh, in the CFT. And then there's a type three one volume algebra there in the CFT, but of course in the CFT we have OPEs, and OPE they define the precise operate uh, uh, algebra for that CFT. So 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 the volume algebra is not about that precise operator structure. Uh, a volume algebra is more like some kind of gross properties which characterize its entanglement nature. So that's why I say. Uh, the volume algebra is the right language to think about entanglement. Uh, yeah. it, it, it's really the language which it, it's a very crude thing. It's it, it's a it does not know anything about OPE. It yeah, does not know anything about OPE. The OPE the structure has to do with a specific theory, a specific CFT, and the uh, volume algebra it just captures that kind of entanglement structure. Yeah. Yeah. Because my comment was more related to the modular flow itself because. That seems to be a, like additional. Uh, so since it's related to the like a time evolution in the bulk, you know, it should be like a, the related to the string products, right? Because you do the time evolution by equation of motion, and that's where the like this uh, this homotopy products enter into the picture. So you know, if you can translate to back to the boundary, that should describe this like a modular flow or somehow related to it, right? Good, 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 good. That's a keep. Uh, 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 that's a certainly very important point. Indeed, indeed, I didn't talk about this explicitly. You can see this in the black hole example. Indeed, so in the boundary theory, you have this algebra, and then you have this automorphism, uh, which is either the modular flow or the half-sided modular flow, etc. And then those in the boundary theory, they just some uh, uh, automorphisms, and but in the bulk, and then they become the times, and then somehow the bulk equation motion 
are encoded in those kind of flows. Yes, that's yeah, true. indeed. So, so, so from the block point of view, indeed, they should capture some of those kind of structure. Yeah. Yeah, because you see, like uh, in, in in string filter, this like it takes a, like some sort of like a more cartan element type of thing, right? It has a like a nice, very nice structure. Right, so right, 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 right. It's like, very difficult to relate. Yeah, yeah, indeed, indeed. Yeah, because of the specific form of the modular flow and the half-sided modular flow of those things, they depend on your specific system. So, so they do know, so they do have the information uh, uh, related to the time evolution, et cetera. And they just say, if you talk about them abstractly, uh, 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 of course, the, uh, uh, they just grossly capture the entanglement, but, uh, but their precise form uh, do capture the uh, specific information, yeah. Yeah, like this sounds like string filter because you know we have this products as a like a background independent thing, but we need to put the, like a two D CFD to make it well defined notion. I mean, That's maybe right. you can even define it more like a flat space or something like that too, because mm -hmm. of that. Okay, right. thank mm -hmm. you, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Let's talk later. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have more questions for Hong? Okay, so just in case, we will stop the recording and just if someone wants to say something uh, of records. Mm -hmm.